<laughs> All right, you guys are live. Um, just be cognizant that now this is anything you say is going to be put on YouTube for all time. So let's let's go with this. Uh, I need you guys to have first of all have graph paper. You don't need it for this. It's like today. You're just going to take notes. You do need a supply of graph paper. And much like the calculators, I'm not going to be coming in every day with a stack of graph paper for you. Uh, if you want the fail-safe way of doing it, go print some out. If you want the good way of doing it, just buy a couple reams of it and have it. Um, you shouldn't need more than <laughs> one ream for the semester, but have it set up with you. Put it in the back of your binder um, and just always, always have some. So that said, uh, I want to know, I want you guys to look a little bit at this because this is the first time we've ever actually dealt with y equals sine of x. Another way to describe this would be f of x is equal to sine of x, where I'm using function notation. Uh, sine is a function that inputs a real number and it outputs the y to r ratio of that angle in radians. Even though your calculator, your graphing calculator, I should say, can change modes to graph sine in, in degrees or radians, most graphing calculators have started to agree that that's not an approach that should be validated. It's not one that you should take. So if I go to um, a graphing calculator that you guys are free to look at, you just can't use it during a test, um, and graph y equals sine x, we're going to notice a few things about it. Before I graph that, I want to talk about its domain. Was that being recorded? No, I paused that. Now I'm resuming. Can you pause it one more time really fast? The domain of any, any sine function. I want you to look at this as I can just basically find the sine of any possible radian measurement angle. Positive goes this direction. Negative angles go that direction. So what, what would I say the domain would be of y equals sine x? What would be all the possible x values that you could plug in? Does that say sine is 6 function? Sine is a function. But I'm asking, what are there any angles that you could not plug into y equals sine of x? Is there any number that you possibly cannot find Zero. an angle? Zero is this right here. Right? It means go right. Positive means to go up. So it would be like a, um, an unreal number? So we're going to say the domain in real numbers. Is there any real number that you cannot find an angle for? No. That's no. So the domain of sine is all real numbers, which we're going to describe as negative infinity to infinity. You can take the number line itself, positive infinity, negative infinity, and I want you to visualize taking that and wrapping it around the circle an infinite number of times in both directions. And you will always be able to figure out where you landed for any number. Meaning that if I pick a number 7, like that, and I wanted to find the sine of 7, well, I can visualize what that means. 7 is a little bit more than 6, or than 6.28, right? 6.28 is 2 pi. This is 2 pi. So if I go 7, so 2 pi is about 6.28. 7 would be right, right about there. So I can, there's a spot, and I could put a point there and drop it down and do the y to, x, or y to r ratio. We could figure out, for example, what the sine of 7 is, even though it's not a, not a rational number. I could, we could still do it. The range is going to be a little bit harder. If the domain is all real numbers, the range, I'm going to draw another grid. And I want you to think about the most that the sine could ever be, the biggest number that the sine of any angle could ever be. What is it? <coughs> What's the sine of, let's start with this, x, y. I'm actually just going to do x sine of x. What's the sine of 0? If I go right put a point down, what is the sine of 0? 
Careful, when I go right, y is not 1. Y would be 0. Yep, so 0 over 1 is 0. The sine of 0 is 0. As you move throughout this first quadrant, your y values get larger and larger relative to the radius until you go up. And now what's your sine value of going upwards? Mm -hmm. This is the ordered pair 0, 1. The sine of pi over 2, which is the upward angle, would be 1 over 1, which is 1. Let's go left again. What's the sine of the left angle? What's the sine of the angle that when I go left, I drop a point down? Ordered pair here, negative 1, 0. Y is 0. It's going to be 0. So I have the, sin, the pi comma 0. And finally, yeah, 3 halves pi, 1 and a half pi. That's the sign of down. And what would the sign of down be? Negative 1. And then finally, this is going to cycle back that way to 2 pi, which is the same angle as 0, and 2 pi is going to give me 0. The most that sine will ever be is 1. The smallest that sine will ever be is the range is from negative 1 to 1. Sine will only cycle between negative 1 and 1. It could include all the possible values between negative 1 and 1, but it will cycle between those things. Not here. You have a function that is infinitely far left and right, but only cycles between negative 1 and 1 on the y value. And it will continue to cycle. So what we're going to do is we're going to graph these ordered pairs up here. And you're going to come up with one of the most unique graphs you've ever done. 0, 0 is a point. I'm going to put a point there. I'm now going to put tick marks here, 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 and here, basically marking every fourth. And I'm going to call this pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and negative 2 pi. Or sorry, positive 2 pi. The tallest that I'm going to go for this graph is going to be y equals 1. Now I'm going to stretch this so that we can have some more space. I'm going to call that 1. I'm going to call this negative 1. And I'm now going to create a box around this. This is to keep my graph contained. Oops, let me erase that and try that again. Contained within this region. I want my tallest to be 1, my smallest to be negative 1. I want to go as far right as 2 pi, and I want to stay as far left as 0. We're going to call this a frame box. And it's going to capture one single frame of sign. I'm going to start at 0, 0. The tallest that it ever reaches comes on this ordered pair right here. I'm going to slide this t-chart down so we can graph it. Pi over 2, 1. If I graph pi over 2, 1, I get this. Then if I graph pi 0, I get this ordered pair. If I graph 3 pi over 2, negative 1, I get this ordered pair. And then 2 pi 0 brings me back to that point. This is going to be a smooth curve, and what I've told students before is to draw each piece separately. Lift your pencil after each one. Here to here is not going to look like this. It's going to be a smooth parabolic curve that looks more like that. Coming back down to the x-axis, we're going to do that piece. Going down again, it's going to look like this, and then it's going to come right back up. This is the first curve of a sine wave. 
but this frame box could be repeated an infinite number of times left and right. So if I did that, let me move this up out of the way, and I drew a second frame box to the right that's the same width, and let me make this line a little bit better. What I get is a curve that actually does this, 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 and this, and would continue. That's a second frame box. Could it go left? Yes. Absolutely. Could go down, down, up, and back down, and I would get one that looks like this. This is an infinite on both sides. This is something that makes this graph periodic. Periodic means that the graph cycles between values. It will always, always, always cycle between x and y values. There are two, two different num things that we're going to change here. We're going to kind of work on changing as few things as possible. But before I do that, I want this to be your example of the graph of y equals sine x. We're going to graph the graph of y equals the cosine of x as well. So I'm going to do a horizontal t-chart on cosine to get this going a little bit better on the page. x and cosine x. And I want to graph those same values. 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. It's going to be one representative cycle of cosine. Now, sine's maximum value is when we went up, and sine's minimum value is when we went down. Cosine's maximum value is when we go right, and its minimum value is when we go left. The cosine of up is nothing because cosine's about the x value. The cosine of down is nothing too. So the cosine of zero. We'll draw this and sketch this out on cosine's graph. What's the cosine of this point right here? 1 over 1. Now we go up for pi over 2. What's the cosine of the up point? Cosine of pi. Keep the pattern going. And then back to 1. On an actual grid that I'm going to draw, and we're going to do the same type of grid we just did before. I'm going to label this 1 and this negative 1. And I'm going to graph these ordered pairs on one cycle. So I'm going to put tick marks here, 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 and here, calling this pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. Just kind of letting my cycle be one, one segment of it. That way, I can keep it going. Sometimes what I've done when I graph this on graph paper is I let every two boxes be one of those so I can stretch it out a little bit. Um, just keep your scale and make sure that your scale is easy to detect as to what it is. Okay, now, I want you to draw the frame box just as you did before. We're going to draw a rectangle. And it's going to encompass your minimum and your maximum values. This is also a single frame box. And you're going to plot this ordered pair down. 0, 1 goes here. Pi over 2, 0. Pi negative 1. 3 pi over 2, 0. And back up to 2 pi, comma 1. Just like before, you're going to draw each piece separately. Connect from point to point very smoothly. What's this going to look like when it's repeated several times left and right? It's going to be the same thing. It's a different picture of the same part, but it's going to be the same thing. So do a couple more. We're going to do one left, or one right and one left. I'm messing up my left and right. Actually, for that matter, I'm going to draw just a couple more of them. So let me just expand the page a little bit. And I'm going to keep this going.
What do you think the word periodic means in the context of these kinds of functions? Within the frame box? Give me a synonym for periodic. If I say these are both periodic functions, and they're the first periodic functions you guys have done, what does it mean for it to be periodic? Okay, we could go with pattern. I like that. So have you guys ever had repeatable elements that you kind of put down on a tiled floor and it just forms a pattern and forms an image, but it's just the smallest repeatable element? Um, so we're going to say pattern or repeatable element. It's one of the things that makes this graph unique. If you have ever played any video game or anything where there is a repeated element, Maybe it is Super Mario Brothers and you have a little Koopa going back and forth on something. That pattern, that motion is modeled by a sine curve or a cosine curve because its position has to be continually confined within a particular region as X gets really, really, really big. So maybe X is time, how long you've been playing, and Y is its position. And for it to cycle back and forth, it should be modeled by something like this. It's one example, one very small example, where sine and cosine curves are used. I want to talk about two little pieces of that. So we did y equals sine x. I'm going to do y equals a times the sine of bx. This is also going to work for y is equal to a times the cosine of bx. Sine and cosine's graphs are very related. They are co-functions of each other, something we're going to describe later what that means but they are very, very, very related. A is called a stretch. If A is positive, the curve or I want to say the curve, we'll say the frame box is right side up. So the frame box looks exactly like what we just drew up above. If A is negative, what happens to the frame box? Yeah, we'll say frame is upside down. So I'm going to do an example of one with a different a value. y equals, let's do 2, we'll do negative 2, times the sine of x. I'm going to call a also a vertical stretch. Because a is really going to act like that. So what I'm going to do is essentially graph the same thing. You can get away with changing just your labels. You don't actually need to make it so that it's 2 and negative 2. But if I put these tick marks here, I'm just going to mark 2 and negative 2 because now I have stretched this graph vertically. Next, I'm going to draw my frame box horizontally. And I'm going to do it kind of like we did before. I'm going to put a box here. I'm going to mark this as 2 pi. And I'm going to mark this as pi. I don't need to put much else. You can if you want to. But I'm not going to put anything else. Because uh, I want to keep this pretty clean as an image. OK, next. I need to figure out what type of graph it is. This is a sine graph. And a sine graph starts at the origin. If it starts at the origin, where does it end? Same place. What's halfway in between the two of them? Pi. Where are we at pi with sine? Are we up, down, or back on the baseline? Baseline. This is how I start sine graphs. I draw three dots down for where the sine graph is. Does a positive sign go up or down? So what does a negative sign do? Yeah. This is a negative curve. Negative starts down. 
So I'm going to put a down point and then an up point between those. Finally, connect. Very carefully, very slowly, just do one, two, three, and four. Your directions are going to ask you to graph more than one period. I'm going to let you pick. Do you want to go right or do you want to go left? Right. I don't really care. You say right, I'm going to go left then. Well, because I already have that empty space there. Or maybe I'll just be an overachiever and do both. That's three periods. What I'm checking for are these right here. I'm checking that you have the numbers right, that you have a 2 pi here, a pi there, and I'm checking that this is a negative sine curve. Okay. One more little point with this. I'm going to add a letter in there and say y equals a sine of bx, and we're going to describe what b does. A normal period or frame has a width of 2 pi. It takes 2 pi for it to come back upon itself and start the cycle over again. If there is a b value, we take the 2 pi and divide it by that b value to get the new period. So let me show you how this is going to look. We're going to do a couple of things here. I'm going to graph y is equal to, we're going to go negative 5 cosine of 4x. From that graph, I'm going to define what my a value is and what my b value is. What's a? And B? Four. Four. So I'm going to now take the B value and say that my period, which is 2 pi over B, is 2 pi over 4. What does 2 pi over 4 simplify to? Pi over 2. Pi over two. Next, we're going to start a graph. And because I want my units to kind of be similar, I'm going to make my frame box be kind of the same. I might go up a little bit differently just to make sure, make it seem that it's stretched. But I'm going to draw the frame box. But it is how I label the frame box that matters more. How you label your frame box matters more than what boxes you use to draw it. What's the highest that my frame box should go? What unit should I put here? What label should I put? Five. My A value was five. Okay. What about down? The period we picked here tells you how far right you go. So now instead of putting two pi here, I'm putting pi over two. What's halfway between zero and pi over two? Yep. This should be pi over four. Okay, now the tricky part. It's a cosine graph. Look back at a basic unit for a cosine graph. Cosine frame box looks like this. This is an inverted cosine graph because A is negative. It's going to be the other way around. Usually cosine starts up at the top, but since it's negative, it's not going to start at the top. It's going to start at the bottom. It will start down here. Wherever it starts, it also ends, because that's what the frame box does. It brings it right back to where it started. Halfway in between the two bottom minimum points, you're going to have a maximum point, way up here. Halfway in between those two points, the minimum and the maximum, where is it going to cross through? 
Where would this have to cross through? Zero. Zero. Just the baseline. And then halfway between the max and min, it's also going to cross through the baseline. That's the hardest part. The drawing's the fun part. Connect very, very gradually. One, two, three, four. To make sure you get it right, you need to draw one more frame box. And like before, I'm going to overachieve and go left and right. I don't care if you guys actually draw the box on the second part. I do want you to put the box on the first one so I can see what your spread is and what your units are. But this is going to go back up and then back down. This is going to go back up and then back down. And I'll draw the cycle a couple more times. Once you put more than one down, it should start to look more like the other kind of wave. One, two, three, four. And that is negative five times the cosine of four x. One more example, then we're done. Uh, I want to do one that has different kinds of units. If I go one half sine of x over five, this one's going to be a little bit tricky because what's your a value? What's your b value? Ignore the x. One over five. Period is equal to two pi over b. So what is 2 pi divided by 1 fifth? 10, 10 pi. Yeah, if you want to simplify this, multiply both the numerator and denominator by 5. And this gives you 10 pi. Wait, so every time it's, every time the period is 2 pi over b, it's plugging the number Every time the period is, you plug in the b, yes. And that tells you what the period is. The first examples we did, the b was 1. So it was just 2 pi. OK, graph. Again, you can draw whatever frame box you want. I would always, always go four units to the right and four units to the left. I don't care how far up or down you go. You can override that with whatever label you put. Does that make sense? Whatever numbers you write down override whatever the boxes are doing on the graph. I just like having enough space to write it out. I have my compulsive kids that always, always want these graphs to be like square and shape. You don't need that. You really, really, really don't. Um, how far up and how far down am I going? I'm going up, one half. up one half and down okay. negative one half. The A value is a vertical stretch. It tells how far up and down it goes. The B value affects the horizontal. What's the rightmost here now? 10 pi. Halfway between 10 pi and 0 is 5 pi. Your final task, once you have your single frame box, is to figure out what the shape is. Is it positive sine, negative sine, positive cosine, negative cosine? This is positive sine. Positive sine looks like this. It starts by going up. It always starts at a baseline. It always ends at a baseline. And halfway in between those two baseline points is another baseline point. In between the first two points, since it's going up, it reaches its maximum. So I'm going to tell you right now, I've seen mistakes happen where people do this. You never fully reach the limits of the frame box. The purpose of the frame box is to decide what are the limits on all sides. This will go all the way down to the lower end, and it goes up, up, back down, down all the way, and back up. And then just simply repeat the units either on the left side, the right side, or both if you want to. So give me one single basic frame box, and then do one or two more. Your directions on your homework only ask you to do one, but. You always want three. That's why I said you can do two if you want. I'm just putting these up because. Even though the directions say two, I'm okay with two, but I will do three. I will when I do when I show them out. Um, hold that thought for one second, and I will get there. Can I go to this and just show you one visual of this, of how it will actually look on a, on a grid? So if you guys do graph this, sorry, my fingers hit the uh, close. Let's give it another second. Open Desmos. If you graph it, A, make sure you are in radiance mode. 
Um, B, your, calcul your graphing calculators actually have a setting that will change the window to B trig. Um, this won't, but there's a way I can override that. So if I graph y equals sine x, first of all, right away you're going to see that familiar wave pattern. Um, I can actually change the axes horizontally to be like from something like negative 6 pi to pi, and then it's going to start, or to 6 pi, and the step will be like pi over 4 or something. Now it's actually going to change my x-axis to be a pi's. Let's put it in projector mode so you can see it. Um, zooming in, I'm going to now change this to have an A value and a B value and show the effects of like what happens when you change them. So your A value is your stretch value. As A gets bigger, what's going to happen to the curve? Yep, so it's going to stretch vertically. And as A gets down, it's going to flatten, flatten, flatten out. What's the B value going to do? Uh huh. Make the wavelength change. So. Look at that skinny one. As B gets bigger, you can say you have a smaller wavelength. Wavelength is the distance from crest to crest. And as B gets less and less and less and less, it gets very, very, very wide. So those are the ones you're graphing, even though on your graphs you won't see it because you're changing the numbers down. So 